Thank you, Matt. Appreciate it. Hi, everybody. My name is Grace Stanky. Um, and you know, it's a really funny story as to how I ended up here because I became Miss America, uh, but I'm a nuclear engineer. What does that have to do with healthcare? Can anybody like think of any connection there? There's not much. So I was really surprised to get this invite to talk about different ways that we can change healthcare here in my home state of Wisconsin and how we can continue to improve this process. I'm a young 22-year-old who's always learning, and listen, I know way too much about taxes, but healthcare, I don't know much about. I just selected most recommended plan when I got my job, and I'm like, sounds good, works for me, I don't really know much past that. But it's the people here in this room right now that I know are working to make the people like me who don't understand healthcare fully have a better lifestyle, and I appreciate that. So I want to start off, um, I, I really wanted to focus on bringing in the people aspect to this. I want to start off with telling you guys a story of how I ended up where I am today. How did I end up as a nuclear engineer? Let's start there, right? I was a 16-year-old teenage girl who had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, as most 16-year-olds don't. Uh, if you did, congrats. You're better than all of us. Huh. Anyways, it's fine. I was 16 years old, and I looked at what I liked in school. I liked math, I liked science, and honestly, the reasoning behind that is I was either right or I was wrong. There was no in-between. I hated getting my English papers back, and they'd be like, you're almost there, you're so close. I'm like, don't do this to me, don't do this to me. So I always liked math and science. My dad was a civil engineer. He took us to construction sites as we were growing up, and I watched him use his powers of math and science to help people live their lives better. And I thought it was cool. He helped people get to and from places by building bridges. He helped them live their daily lives. His one impact made a pretty big impact on everybody else around him. So I knew engineering was the direction I wanted to go in, but if you know anything about engineering, there's a lot of different types. You've got civil, electrical, mechanical, biomed, nuclear. Like, there's a bunch of even just made up types of engineering that I just am like, I don't even know how we got into microcellular something engineering, but it's okay. So I'm 16 years old, and in true Midwest fashion, when I'm touring colleges, my mom and I go on a road trip as Midwesterners always do, all right? And we were specifically at Texas A&M University, actually. And I remember going through the lists of different types of engineering. And listen, I looked at civil, and I'm like, eh, that's what my dad did. They're just dirt pushers. I don't wanna do that, okay? Looked at mechanical, I'm like, everybody goes into mechanical engineering. I don't wanna do that either. I wanna be special, you know? I'm not doing mechanical. Electrical engineering, eh, my brother's an electrical engineer. There is no way I'm gonna follow in my older brother's footsteps and go into electrical engineering. But I look at nuclear engineering, and I'm gonna be honest, all I know at this point in time about anything nuclear science related is bombs from World War II history class, and that there's like maybe two nuclear power plants in all of America. That was my level of knowledge at this point in time. But I read nuclear engineering, and I think to myself, man, what a flex it would be to say I'm a nuclear engineer. How could you go wrong with that, right? That 50th high school class reunion, I better win best career. I better. So that was entirely what started this process of me going down this, this path that I've, I've gone down for the past six years. I go back home after touring colleges, and I'm talking with my dad, and, and you know, my dad is, is a big guy. He's 6'6", um, so if you've noticed I'm tall, that's where I get it from. He's 6'6", big tall blonde guy, you know, and we're having that, that parental advice moment. I'm like, okay, dad, listen, hear me out. I'm thinking either nuclear engineering or aerospace engineering. What are your thoughts? You know, my dad, he, he looks at me and he goes, Grace, don't go into nuclear. There's no future there. How many of you have, have or have had teenage daughters? Show of hands. When you tell your teenage or former teenage daughter not to do something, what does she do? 
She goes and does it. So that's exactly what I did. I got into nuclear engineering out of spite. Yet here I am today, standing as an actual nuclear engineer on the Forbes 30 under 30 energy list with all of this other stuff that I won't dive into. But like, how did we get to where I am today? When I filled out my UW-Madison application, I selected nuclear engineering. I went, huh, I'm going to show him. It's fine. I'm going to prove him wrong. And I ended up getting accepted into UW-Madison. And you know, as, as I was driving down to move into college, I was like, am I, am I making a mistake? Realistically, I knew that if, if my dad was right, one, I would never verbalize that to him. And two, I can always switch majors, right? That's something that I think a lot of us as, as young people or for, for kids that you may have, you know, it's not talked about enough that it's okay to switch majors after you get into college, right? So I knew that, okay, even if this doesn't come together like I imagine and I have this heroic, ha, you were wrong dad moment, it's okay. Now I went to school. And that entire first semester at college, I was taking all of these different courses. And I learned that nuclear science played a much bigger role in my life than I realized. Played a much bigger role in my dad's life as well. He's a two-time cancer survivor because of different forms of nuclear medicine and technology. I learned on the energy and power side, it powers 20% of America. There is indeed more than two nuclear reactors in all of America. Uh, there's about 95 right now, okay? A lot more than two. I learned that bananas are radioactive, avocados, granite countertops, smoke detectors, exit signs. These things are all parts of our daily life and we didn't even know what they were a part of. We didn't know that it was nuclear science, which is a word that we're all slightly afraid of when I say, hey, I'm a nuclear engineer. How many of you were like, she definitely builds bombs? No doubt. So you're not the only person in the room that was thinking that, and you're not the first person who has said that. I've had many people say that to my face. And this is where I really want to take the time to talk about these grassroots movements, because that exact passion that I found of why was I so confused about nuclear science and why did I not realize how much this had to offer, I wanted to start changing that perspective. I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to start just at the grassroots level. I went into rotary clubs, local high schools, elementary schools, any, literally anybody in the Madison community where I was living at the time, anybody who would take me to just come in and talk to them about how does nuclear science play a role in your life? One of my favorite things is to talk about, all right, have you had a surgery? I'm assuming, I'm, that maybe sound rude if I say I'm assuming a lot of people in this room have. Um, anyways, moving on. So, <laughs> surgeries, the tools are sterilized using nuclear radioisotopes. A lot of people don't know that. It's everywhere. MR MRI machines, magnetic resonance imaging machines. When they first came out, when they were first invented and created, they were called NMRI machines, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging machines but people wouldn't get into them because they had that scary word nuclear in the beginning. So they just got rid of it. And now it's a commonly accepted and widely used piece of technology in the medicine industry, right? It's everywhere. So I wanted to change this. Why were people scared of the word nuclear? I ended up starting to compete in the Miss Wisconsin organization because uh, it's a scholarship organization. And when I also got to college and got excited about nuclear, I also learned adulting really sucks. Um, it's not fun having bills. Don't recommend, don't recommend. Anyways, so that was one thing that, that freshman year of college, I realized I needed help paying for school. I needed help to make my way through it. I started competing in Miss Wisconsin to not only gain those scholarship dollars, but to help give myself a platform to discuss nuclear on a wider level. And I dealt with people who would scream in my face, who would 
curse me out, who would say some really obscene things to a 17, 18 year old girl at the time, just because I wanted to talk to them about nuclear science. Chances are you're gonna have similar experiences like that too. When you're working on solving this huge problem of healthcare within the state of Wisconsin, not everyone's gonna be great. Not everyone's gonna be friendly. Not everyone's gonna be welcoming and accepting. What I do now as I've continued to grow and establish this advocacy that I do on, in terms of nuclear, I look back to the Midwest a lot. Now, I'm really excited that we have not just Wisconsin people here because it truly is a Midwest thing. There are three things from the Midwest that I'm eternally thankful for that I had instilled in me. And I Googled, what are the top three traits that Midwesterners have? And the top three things are really fun. The first one is kindness. We all know Wisconsin nice. We all know that we're always holding the doors open for people until they literally drop. Like, that's just how it goes. We're probably gonna hear a lot of jokes about that from Charlie later tonight, and I'm super excited. I don't know about you guys, I've never seen him before. It's gonna be fun. So in that aspect, kindness is number one. Does anyone wanna take a guess as to what number two is? Work ethic? Work ethic? Okay, that's number three, spoiler. But what is number two? The weather is unpredictable. How is that a personality trait? I don't know, okay? But we're gonna start with item number one, kindness. And I wanna take you guys back to uh, my dad going through cancer and the two times that he went through it. The first time I was in fourth grade, I honestly had very little concept of what was going on. I didn't understand cancer. I didn't understand anything other than my dad is really, really sick and I don't know why I'm spending Easter with other family instead of my parents. That's all I could recognize at the time. My parents were in the hospital and they didn't want their kids spending Easter in the hospital. So we spent time with other family. And it confused me. Thankfully, throughout that process, my, my dad healed and went through all the chemo, all that sort of good stuff, whatever they did, I don't fully know, and he recovered. And it was about three years later, I was in eighth grade. My older brother and sister had gone off to college at this point, so as the youngest child, of course, I got the great family vacations. It's okay, no worries. <laughs> but we were in D.C. And my family has always been very active. We love going to national parks. We love exploring. We love hiking. Uh, and we were in DC, and I'll never forget that day when we realized the cancer was back. It was me, my mom, and my dad. And we were walking to the Jefferson Memorial. It was about a two-mile walk from where we were, which for us, on flatland, that shouldn't be a problem. We all had comfortable shoes on. We were all good to go. It was about three quarters of a mile in that my dad could not make it. He was collapsing, he was on the sidewalk. It was a moment of, okay, we're going home to figure this out right now. I was in eighth grade. My mom, she knew what was going on. She said it to me, she said, this might be it coming back. We wrapped up the trip, we went home. The doctors confirmed it. His spleen had grown to the size of a basketball uh, with cancer that had filled it. His stomach had then in turn shrunk and he wasn't really able to take food at that point because his stomach had shrunken so small. So very quickly, uh, they had the surgery to remove the spleen and it's really, really weird because my dad was like, can you take a picture of my spleen? Is that common? Like, is that normal for, for surgical patients to be like, hey, can I get a picture of the organ that you're taking out of me? I don't know, weird things, but I do have the picture if anybody wants to see it. It's the surgeon just all geared up and it's literally like, <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> I don't know, man, it's weird. So he had the spleen taken out and he had the cancer left in a couple of lymph nodes. Now I was a freshman in high school at this point in time, you know, and I was in biology class. And it hit a lot closer to home 
when I learned about cancer in biology that day, it hit very close to home. I was scared. I suddenly understood the science of what was attacking my dad on a basic high school level. But it wasn't just little fourth grade me being confused anymore. I knew I wanted to be there for my dad. I knew I wanted to have him. Oh my God, I always like, I give this speech and I can do it on my own and I never tear up and then I'm on the stage and I tear up. Anyways, I knew at that moment, I would want my dad walking me down the aisle. I knew I would want him to see grandkids, to see life. That's all I wanted. Now I went through, he had to go through what was called an analogous bone marrow transplant, which for seven days they gave him two doses of chemo a day. Their goal was to eliminate all of his bone marrow and inject him with healthy bone marrow and let it rebuild to prevent it coming back a third time, the cancer. That's a really scary treatment. Their goal was to bring him as close to dead as possible. My brother and sister were at college. It was me and my mom trying to figure it out. The things that I remember is the kindness, is the neighbors who brought over casseroles or enchiladas. Those were my favorite, chef's kiss. The neighbors who gave us nail files because they knew nail clippers weren't allowed in the hospital. And after spending a month in the hospital, there's nothing more annoying than long nails. Having a deck of cards given to us by the nurse so we could sit there and just play cards with him to keep his mind active. That kindness is what I remember. I remember the bad days, but I remember the good days more. And I'm so thankful for the Midwest and for that kindness because now when I have people yelling at me about whatever it may be, whether it is at a political office, I've spoken to the Secretary of Energy, I've spoken to presidents of nations, I've worked with so many people in the energy industry, and they yell, some people yell, it's a great time. That's when I come back to sit there and say, what would my neighbor who gave me the enchilada do? Unfortunately, not everyone loves enchiladas, and I can't always just like, whip out an enchilada to give to an angry secretary, but it's fine, it's fine. There still is the ability to practice that human connection. It's a lot harder for someone to yell at you when you're talking about puppies first, right? I just got a puppy a couple weeks ago. His name is Captain, he's a golden retriever. He's the cutest thing on the planet and I love him so much. I hope you're all dog people here, no pressure. Now to go through and actually know somebody's name and you're trying to get something done, that goes such a long ways. Which sounds really wild because like I know you all are Midwesterners and you get it. You'll gladly share cheese curds. Talk about your local dairy farm. I grew up, I, I was inspired, thank you. <laughs> I grew up not too far away from one of the, the primary Mullins, so for me, coming in here and seeing Mullins was like a little bit of a taste of home. It was really cool. <laughs> and that's something that I'm so thankful for, is that kindness. Now the second point, the weather is unpredictable. You know, when I first saw that, I kind of was like, okay, we're just gonna leave it at that because that's not a personality trait. But I, I, I talked about this with some friends and somebody, they, one of my friends came up to me and, and they pointed, made a really good point. They're like, no, that means you're really ready and versatile to handle any situation. And I'm like, you're right. When we got 20 inches of snow, when we were only supposed to get two, and the shovel was left out by the shed, my dad looked at his resources and said, Grace, go get the shovel, have fun. Thanks, Dad, love you. <laughs> but we're resourceful. We make the best of every situation because we know that some things are out of our control. So what is within our control and how can we optimize it? That's a Midwesterner. That's not everywhere. I recently moved to Delaware in March, sad. I do plan on hopefully coming back to Wisconsin at some point. 
And listen, I get why East Coasters don't road trip, first of all, um, because like traffic in general, oh my God, I wanna cry. I had my entire time of living in Wisconsin for six years driving as a driver, I honked my horn once. And it was because someone didn't see me while they were merging over and I'm like, oh no, please don't. That was the only time I've honked my horn. I moved to Delaware and last week alone, I honked it at least four times. And I'm like, oh God, what's happening? I don't like this. Now the third trait, hardworking. You brought that up. That is something that is so true. This grassroots work doesn't just happen. It doesn't take just one person. It doesn't take just two. It takes a community and a village. And we see that in this room right here, right now. You all showed up here for a reason. You want to make this better. You want it to be better for 22-year-olds like me or for whoever it may be, the doctors. It's something that I was learning a lot about in the last talk when it comes to healthcare. I'm like, oh, this is really cool. I'm gonna save that tab on my phone for when I have to get surgery. Thank you, Dr. Keith Smith. That's seriously, hands down, ha props to him. But you're here to do better. Just like 16-year-old me who liked math and science and wanted to just do better for the world around us. I strongly encourage you guys to remember that kindness, no matter what circumstance you're in, especially, I I'm gonna say this because I know that this is an okay audience to say this in, especially when working with government agencies or working on the government side, there's a reason it exists, but we have to exercise kindness and patience to understand how can we make this better, not just for our end, but for their end too. How can we optimize this for everybody involved? Asking those questions and taking the time to do the hard work matters. I could go into a really long story about how we do that at a nuclear power plant, but I feel like this isn't the audience for that. Do you guys wanna hear about that? Contributes to safety of nuclear power? It's okay, we won't. Um, but <laughs> it is so crucial. It is so crucial to remember those three traits. Because this isn't gonna be something that is just affecting Wisconsin. I know that this is the first meeting, but Dr. Keith Smith made a really great point too. You're starting the conversation right here. And it's going to grow immensely. It's going to grow nationwide. Remember that kindness. Remember that even when the weather's tough, you can always make it work. And remember to put in the hard work for it. That work ethic, it's amazing. Now with that, I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you guys so much for everything, for taking the time to listen today and to be here today. I really appreciate you listening to me as a non-healthcare person. You all are the best, thank you.